the evening of May 27th, 2009, and on the line from Los Angeles is writer, researcher, musician, and author Alex Constantine. Thanks for taking the time to come on the show, man. I appreciate it. And thank you. It's good to be here. I was really glad to get in contact with you. The more I work on the site and the more I research parapolitics and alternative history, I kept finding myself coming back to some of your sites, alexconstantine.blogspot.com and The Blacklist, and we'll actually link all those up in the show notes for this. But I'm really curious, actually, how you got into this big, messy world. Well, I've been doing this a long time. I started 21 years ago, and I came to Los Angeles from Ohio. I had worked for a, for a comp- tiny machine tool company out there. And they they were laid off due to Jap they were laying off due to Japanese competition and that company eventually sort of went under, was bought out by another concern, and it sort of disappeared off the face of the earth. But so I moved on to Los Angeles and I came out here to write plays and um, you know, movie scripts, uh, that sort of thing. Also wanted to write fiction. That was my big ambition in life. And then I attended a trial in San Francisco because I started out here writing news stories book reviews, play reviews, that kind of thing. And I went up to San Francisco to attend a murder trial and didn't know what I was really getting into here because it involved uh, two Satanists who had kidnapped a homeless guy off the street. They took him home, shot him up with phenobarbital, and then proceeded, tied him up, and then proceeded to carve on his body. And they tortured this guy all night long. They ate parts of his body. They carved a, a pentagram into his chest. And then he, the, the man bled to death, and then they left the, the body under a truck uh, south of the of market in San Francisco. And uh, this was all shocking to me, and I, I attended the first day of trial and got sick, physically sick after listening to all this. Went back the second day, heard the lead witness in the case, who was a, a kid by the name of Eddie who had been staying at the house at the time of the murders, and he'd been asleep on the couch when it happened but he woke up and witnessed part of what was going on there and he, he eventually became the key informant for the local police department so I, I grabbed this kid after the after he testified and talked to him for three days uh, took notes on everything he had to tell me and it took me seven years to actually answer all the questions that I had about this particular murder because they led in all sorts of directions including the Reagan White House, Bechtel Corporation, the CIA, who actually picked this kid off the street and interviewed him for three days, uh, held him for questioning. And, of course, I wanted to know what in the hell the CIA had to do with all this and why they were interested in the murder and why there were political connections and corporate and so forth. So I come back to Los Angeles with all these questions, and then over the next month I spent $500 calling experts in the field, um, Law, law officials, uh, all sorts of people, anyone who, who was involved in Satanism and mind control. Eventually, that study in Satanism led me into fascism and Nazism, CIA mind control experiments, other other types of human experimentation, uh, the intelligence community in general, which is entirely criminalized, and uh, I became obsessed. Uh, didn't do anything, I guess, for about the next 10 years for research. I never watched television, didn't really go to movies. I, I didn't see a movie for 10 years. All I did basically was research, and that was because that sense of uh, the critical sense that began in 1988 just never left me. I still have it to this day, as, as if knowing will somehow stop all this, and I've been trying ever since, you know, at least to do my part. So my key concern became fascism, especially after I discovered the work of Mae Brussel. And I, I ordered up $100 worth of her tapes back then, studied the tapes, went on the air on her radio station, took over her time slot, her old time slot, at a, a, a station called KAZU, which is still there, but now it's not independent. It's owned by NPR. And for five years I did that until the CIA grabbed me and tortured me and forced me off the air. Um, my mail would show up torn open. I was followed everywhere I went, photographed. Um, I had stalkers, all sorts of things going on. And none, none of that was going to de- deter someone as obsessed as I was, and I'm still still doing it today. 
And if you visit, I have four different websites where I post information and write articles, and I'm still doing it. So I didn't know you were originally from Ohio and maybe had a little bit of a theater background. I'm from West Virginia and have oh, a, little, right? a little bit of a theater background. I've done a bit of sound design and a little bit on stage. But I'm, well, I've been out in Portland for about four years now. Well, I was um, I studied literature for six years. I um, taught literature for a while. And that, that was basically my key concern, including drama, of course. And um, now it's politics, and the interesting thing is that I get the same sort of fulfillment from doing what I do now as, as I did writing plays and, and fiction. Absolutely. That's, again, I kind of can echo those sentiments. I was more involved in theater and sound design, but my sort of awakening event was, of course, 9-11. But mm -hmm. I do come from a background of Southern Baptist upbringing. I went to the Emanuel Baptist Church till I was 15 years old. And Good so, God. yeah, and so I'm familiar with the the background of some of these the areas of of whether it's Satanism or mm -hmm. sinister forces within the music and the media. So again, you know, when when you're a little kid and they're showing you and playing, you know, playing Queen backwards for you and telling you where the satanic messages are and talking about the movies, all it did was uh. make me want to get involved in music and the movies. <laughs> so well, I once I Go ahead. I dug into the, into the very hardcore stuff, and um, basically, what I was concerned with was um, was murders. How the intelligence um, agencies not only use satanic cults as fronts for mind control, but um, but um, also uh, how they use them to kill. And uh, if you study the Son of Sam murders, for instance, you'll find that there were particular victims that they wanted to get rid of. And when I use the word they, I'm talking to higher-ups in the organization. These tended to be very rich people in New York State who were calling the shots, so to speak. And those people are still around, so I traced their movements. And Son of Sam was one case that I followed. I mean, there were connections to the Manson murders, um, also intelligence and Nazi connections. And, uh, you know, I take, uh, as, they, as this information comes along day by day, I assemble these things and put them together. Now, you were interested in 911. You were talking about your own research in that. 911 has deep ramifications. Uh, uh, you said before the program that you wanted to talk about Flight 3407, which is a perfect example. Uh, because 3407 also has connections to 911 and to the current wars uh, going on around the world. Uh, there were five, four. Uh, people from north of Grumman on board, and several of the several of them were involved in electronic warfare operations over in Europe. And you may remember there was a, a crash that took place uh, within a few was it a week or so within a week or so of the Buffalo crash, and that was in um, that was in Amsterdam. And there were um, uh, Boeing employees who, who were killed in that crash, and they were also involved in this electronic warfare program that's being sold to Turkey and to Europe. And the reason that, um, that we're gearing up this whole program is because we're making a trade. In exchange for the electronic warfare technology that we're giving away to Europe, uh, they're going to be helping us in operations in Afghanistan, and it's a quid quo pro. Uh, so we have four different uh, employees of Northrop Grumman involved in this electronic warfare stuff. Uh, who die in Buffalo on February 12th, but then we go back to November, we find that the founder of North of Grumman Amherst Systems near Buffalo, where these other four were employed, also died in the plane crash. And this, uh, this struck, this struck a house, uh, two ways, two miles away from the runway. It was a Cirrus, uh, 22, had trouble approaching the runway engine trouble and crashed in a driveway just two, two miles away from the airport. Now, this is this was a guy by the name of Donald A. Hess, founder of North of Groom and Amherst Systems, who died in that previous plane crash. And he has an interest, interesting history also because he was head of the local um, conservative party in Buffalo, New York. And that is to say that the Republican Party wasn't right-wing enough for this guy he has to be the head of the conservative party in Buffalo just to let everyone know how far right he is. 
he's central to this electronic warfare program that I was discussing. But it's interesting that he was also on the board of directors of Hoffman Woodward Medical Center, where they did studies uh, founded by leading pharmaceutical companies, who I'll, I'll describe later, where they did studies on the transfer of disease from animals to human beings. And if you think of this in, 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 in terms of a timeline leading up to swine, the swine flu outbreak in Mexico, these crashes are, just, happen just before all this be, begins to take place. Uh, those studies were founded by uh, Merck and a company called Invacare, which turns out to be extremely interesting, um, as well as everything else that I'm, I'm going to discuss here. Uh, the 3407 crash occurs on February 12th, seven miles away from the airport. And on board, you have a number of people who have who have military connections. Most, a lot of these people who died on this in this plane crash were in the Army Reserves, the the Air Force Reserves. Some of them were involved in intelligence operations. And if you take the the sum total of these people on board the plane. You've got to say this is a, a statistical oddity, and it just couldn't be that that these many people with these connections on board one airplane. This does not happen by accident. And in order to cover it all up, we go to the NTSB and we find a guy by the name of Mark V. Rossinger, who who has no background at all in investigating airplane crashes because he was G.W. Bush's military liaison to the Pentagon before Bush appointed him to, to be chairman of the NTSB. Now, you want someone in that position who, who knows about plane crashes, you know, is perhaps a pilot himself who, who knows planes inside out, uh, knows what he's doing. This guy is military and his background is in public relations and he's totally, totally out of his element. And that's why we get all sorts of BS explanations for the 3407 crash and uh, this has been a whole series of them. Now, any questions so far? Well, I, I wanted to point out the part that I think that originally caught my attention, and now as I'm thinking about it, perhaps that was the best trick, in a way. Beverly Eckert was one of the folks that died on there's, there's the crash. There's a 911 connection. She had previously, seven days prior, met with Obama as well as some of the other 9/11 victims' family members, some of the some of the Jersey girls, as well as I believe some of the USS Cole family members. That's right. That's right. And this meeting and she was pushing for uh, she's pushing for an investigation of 911, right? And from at least the way that I saw it painted, from what I could gather from the meeting, it almost sounded as if the families were all sort of mollified and oh well, Obama, he's he, you know he's going to do a good job. That they almost just kind of seemed. To be placated for the time being. Well, I wouldn't blame her for that. I mean, that was the general attitude. So now, seven days general, later, seven days later, this one, yeah. one of the 9/11 widows, she dies in in the crash of flight 3407, which, as we said, was February 12th. Right. Her husband was Sean Ro Rooney, who died in the crash, or in uh, on 911. Mm -hmm. And so, in we 98th floor of uh, the South Tower. But now as we see all of these other connections start to spill out, whether it's the private military contractors or the pharmaceutical interests and swine flu and what have you, it almost maybe seems that Beverly Eckert is the sort of attention-getting thing that maybe well-meaning folks like myself, you know, but small bloggers might focus on the 9-11 angle and perhaps not go deeper into the story. Well, I think that's, uh, I think that's partly true that there are other connections that were hidden because Beverly Eckert was on the front page. But she was also pushing not only for an investigation of 911, but she wanted uh, exhaustive intelligence reform legislation. She had been a part of drafting legislation that, that was stalled and killed in the House by Republicans. So I believe that she really is integral to all this, but she is the most recognizable figure. There were others, uh, also, uh, a woman by the name of Alison DeForge, who worked um, for Human Rights Watch, and she was revered by liberals for her work on Rwanda, but if you look at her work closely, you'll find that she, she censors out all information leading to Northrop Grumman 
and Halliburton and other contractors who were working in, in Rwanda at the